Today, I want to talk about data visualization and why it's important. It was one of the most critical skills that I learned during my PhD, and it helped me with three things. It helped me to visualize the data, obviously, because there was a lot of data, um, and I had phenotypic data, genotypic data, and essentially a million uh, data points. So to make sense or just, just to let my human brain wrap around what this data was, it was very important. And then that allowed me to help, that helped me make decisions based on the data. So the data starts telling a story. What is going on here? How can I, how can my brain, human brain wrap around it in order to make a decision based on the story that the data is telling me? And then the third thing was the, the presentation of the data. So I could use it in, in my publications, in my thesis, research posters and presentations. You got these very elegant, very cool looking figures that you can then use to put on your poster, put in your presentation that really say, wow, this is cool. Uh, the audience likes, loves it. It really draws it in as long as you don't make it too complicated, but it really helps you tell your story. So those are the three things. So let's get into it. What I want to talk about today is, is creating a heat map. So within my research, like I said, I have phenotypic and genotypic information, and I wanted to create a heat map to help tell the story of what my data was doing. So uh, similar to previous tutorials that I've done, I'm going to use my parallel, parallel per computing uh, stack here. This is basically just um, boilerplate code that I use in, in every tutorial, wherever I go, um, always kind of put stuff like this in the top, including Deplier, using that tidyverse functionality. Um, and then I'm gonna bring in my genotypic data set. So I've previously done this, and this takes a while to load because it's a large data set of SNPs. So I bring it in, I can look, look, at, look a little bit at it here. I've already removed the first couple of columns so this is what this code does. It removes the name, some of the metadata that I don't need because when we're building the dendrogram, so the heat map is essentially two dendrograms, one for phenotypic data, one for genotypic data, and then, and then the heat map below it, looking at the, how the, the phenotypic data correlates uh, within the genotypic data. So this is my SNP data and it, it, you need to make it look like this. So if you have SNP data close, close to mine, you need essentially negative ones, zeros, and ones that you can plug in and no other code or no other columns or data within that data frame. So SNPs are across the top. So that's the column driven and then the row driven are the different genotypes. So in my data, I had 292 genotypes. Then similar to my previous tutorial, which was building a dendrogram, we're gonna build a dendrogram again. And to do that with my data, I'm gonna use the NAM package and I'm going to use the gdist function. So look at the genetic distance within these SNPs, within these genotypes. Just using method one, I think that's nay distance, N-E-I. So I'm going to run that. And I did that already. I'm not going to do it again because that may take a little bit of time. And then I'm going to create a dendrogram. So the, like I said earlier, the heat map is two dendrograms. Bring in the dend extend library and I could create a dendrogram based on this gdist object that I previously created in words D and then I can plot it out and let's see what we get here. So this is what the dendrogram looks like according to words D. There's different uh, methods that you can use but I usually use the words D or the complete method and then what I want to do is I want to make the branches a little bit thicker I want to color the branches. So this is all similar to what I did on my last tutorial, looking at dendrograms. You can see that in a link in the description. And so I made things a little bit thicker and I want to add that color. So because my dendrogram, I cut it into eight different clusters. So these 292 genotypes were cut into eight different clusters, uh, which I have here. And I want to color those branches, these eight different colors. And you can choose whatever colors you want for this. You can use a color palette, so it's more of a rainbow spectrum. I have these pre-selected so that I, I can fit them how I want them, but I mean, they're, they're yours to customize. So here we go. Everything's a little bit thicker. You've got the color there. 
looking at the different clusters and you can see that the line or the, the tree was cut right about there. And then I want to bring in my phenotypic data and there it is, bring in all data and my data is, I took it over three days so I split, usually split it into three days. Today I'm just going to look at the day nine data and so I subset it into three days. Here we've got a lot of, a lot of column headers so I can see some of the phenotypic data in this, this area. That's what I'm going to be using today. So I could use it all, I could use a portion of it, and that's, that's what I want to decide. So in this next step, what I have here is I want to select the phenotypic data to showcase in the heat map. And so I decided to choose these descriptors, total root length, primary root length, width, convex area, lateral root branching, number, volume, uh, length distribution, rise, the rhizosphere area, the total root length of the upper third portion of the root, and the root weight. So I can use my pipe. Oh, so we got my day nine data, pipe it and select these ones and turn it into phenotypic traits will be the object that I'll use. Boom, so that's done. Now, in order for this to work, because this data is all different, for example, this rhizosphere area is a very large number and the root weight is a very small number. So if you put this on the same, on the same figure with each other, one will blow the other one out of the water essentially so it'll look at rhizosphere area and the root weight will all be the same just because it's not scaled so next we're going to scale it and what we do is use the scale function and i believe that's just based on the stats package within r so it should be natively there you need it to set it as a matrix and basically scale it so you know let's just take took a, take a look at that data for pheno uh, so pheno traits Right, so we've got about 200 here, 30s, 15, 200, you know, rhizosphere is in the thousands and in root rates, very small. So we need to scale the data so it's all on the level playing field and we can do that with this function, which we just did. And let's take a look at that again. But, phenotrade scale, boom, there you go. And everything's kind of slid in between, I think, negative 4 and positive 4 according to this function. As long as it's all standardized, normalized within itself, it does. I don't really care if it's between negative 1 and 1 or negative 1,000 and positive 1,000s as long as it's scaled. So we can look at a summary too and kind of look into this. And, and what, I'm, what I'm keying on is just the minimums and the maximums. So you want the minimums and the maximums to be similar just so later on when we create our heat map it all kind of falls into that same area and a dark blue is a dark blue and a bright orange is a bright orange according to every single phenotypic trait that we're using so we're done that next step is to calculate the phenotypic distance so i'm going to do exactly very similar approach to what i have done previously create a dendrogram using hierarchical clustering looking at the distance between different traits. So it's going to go down every column, look at every different trait, and create a dendrogram accordingly. So similar to um, the genotypic data, we have a dendrogram created. And you can see here that width and convex area are very highly related. Total root length and rhizosphere area are very highly related. But something like primary root length is not very related to the rest here. So there's definitely different clusterings that happen. And you can break these clusters into different groupings as, as well. And essentially just cut the tree wherever you want to cut it into eight. Uh, I'm not going to use eight groups because we only have maybe ten here. So eight groups wouldn't really be, really, wouldn't, really wouldn't be helpful. So let's use um, maybe five. We'll use k equals five. Next step is we'll do something similar to before making the branches a little bit thicker, creating colors. So I used five different colors for this in the next set here, color branches, phenodend, k equals five, using the colors from that I specified here. Again, you can change and customize to how you see fit or use a color palette like a rainbow. Rainbow really comes alive when you have more numbers. So just having five, it probably doesn't make sense, but do what you want and we can plot that out and then here we go. Now we have five different colors all set here according to the tree was cut approximately right here, I believe. So we've got five different clusters. Next thing we want to do is create the heat map. 
So we have the data. The color of your heat map um, is up to you again. I'm going to use the, the gplots library to use this color panel. This color panel is a cool function because it allows you to, to look at the low, medium, and high and select the range and then how many colors between, between the low, medium, and high. So I have 292, which is way too much. 50 is more than enough. So there'll be 50 shades or 50 individual colors between orange, white, and blue, creating kind of a gradient with 50 colors in between. I think once you get past 20, um, you probably won't tell the difference. So we'll create that and implement that in our heat map function. So I'm using the heat map dot two function. Select our data. So phenotypic data here, that's our X value. So that's that it, the heat maps can be based off the phenotypic data, not the genotypic data. The genotypic data only gives us the clustering that we're interested in. We're not actually interested in the numeric values of the zeros, uh, the, the ones and the negative ones. And so on your row, uh, we want to use the, the genotypic dendrogram for your column. We want to use the phenotypic dendrogram. And then for the colors, we want to use the specified blue orange palette that I've created here, or you can change it to however you'd like. I find blue and orange is good. Look at a color wheel and you want to see um, blue is across from yellow or orange. So there's a lot of distinction between the two of them. You don't want to use a yellow and a red or a, a red and an orange because they're too similar and it won't really help you tell your story. Scale equals none, density info, info equals none, uh, trace none. You can set your margins how you like it. Again, this is just creating your figure itself. And if you want to change the, the row and the, and the column width, I believe that's there. And then your labels you can set and your main heading. So let's run it and let's see what our heat map looks like. There we go. Let me uh, zoom in. Let's pull this across. Uh, shrink it a little bit. So I like the blue and the orange because there's definitely contrast. You can see the darker blue um, <clears throat> are very high numbers is what I have set. The, the darker orange are very low numbers. And this really helps you tell a story. For example, this particular cluster here at the bottom, it's a smaller cluster and it, there's a lot of darker orange set in here. So that means that, hmm, there's something happening there. They're not performing very well. Whereas you see maybe this area, there's some darker blue. So you know that these genotypes by and large perform better. There's some darker blue up here as well. Uh, this one's pretty dark blue. There's some white in there, but you know, by and large are good. And so this really helps you kind of sit down and, and say, okay, what's going on? What's the story that my data is trying to tell me? And here you have it. So if you want to switch it, let's try, let's try switching the colors. Let's go to magenta as being the low and uh, green as being the high. So all you have to do is run that and run that and where there you go. You've got a much different, <clears throat> much different looking heat map. One thing that I was trying is trying to do a fiery heat map. So going yellow to orange to red. And I found that this, this didn't work very well. So yeah. I had high hopes for this looking really cool, really, really fiery, like heat, but yeah, you can't really, it makes it difficult to, to discern the differences between red and orange and yellow. Anyway, then you can output it here as a TIFF, just unlock this and run that whole, whole thing and it'll push it out to your file and away you go. Anyway, I hope you learned something today. If you have any, any comments or questions, please ask me um, below and I'll do my best to, to help you. There's other tutorials like this, some that have these color bars that instead of uh, making the, instead of making the, the dendrograms in different colored branches, they have bars that kind of line them up. I find just coloring the dendrogram itself is much more helpful for me. Yeah, if you have any questions, let me know. Good luck. Have fun. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.